grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, the Lord said to Abraham, for I will give it to you. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. With a length of about 145 miles and a breadth of anywhere between 30 to 60 miles, the square mileage of the Holy Land is somewhat less than that of New Jersey. But that was the land that the Lord commanded Abraham to walk. And so Abraham did. And as he walked the land, what did he see? Well, along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, the western portion of the Holy Land, are what are called the coastal plains, flat level areas. And Abraham would have been, very, been able to walk those areas very easily. But as you move inland, you come to the hill country of Judea, actually mountain country, with mountains like Gerizim and Tabor, and perhaps the one we're most familiar with, the Mount of Olives. After scaling those elevations, as Abraham would head further inland to the east, he would go into the Jordan Valley. Now the southern end of the land of Canaan, the Holy Land, is a desert region called the Negev, very barren. A little to the north of the Negev, you have the Dead Sea region. The Dead Sea is the lowest place on the face of the earth at about 1,400 feet below sea level. And it is also the most densely salty water on the face of the earth. In this harsh environment, obviously no fish can live and there's no vegetation for land animals either. Abraham would have seen that. But as he would move further north, up the Jordan River, he would come to the Sea of Galilee. And that territory was lush and green because of the fresh water of that sea. Well, Abraham was told to walk the Holy Land, not just so he could take inventory of what his descendants would inherit from the Lord, but walking the land Placing his footsteps throughout that land was to lay claim to that land. That's what kings would do in their lands. They would walk the land to demonstrate that they owned the land. And although Abraham would only own one parcel of land at the time of his death, because the Lord had promised that this land would be given to Abraham and his descendants after him. Abraham walked the land as if the promise had been fulfilled because that is how sure God's promises are. It seems, if you'll pardon me saying it, that the Lord God had an obsession with this land and with this particular man, Abraham. Abraham, after he had first come to the Holy Land, the land of Canaan, had to sojourn in Egypt because of a famine. But the Lord God saw to it that Abraham returned from Egypt to the land promised to him. And when he and Lot were dividing up the land, the Lord God made sure that the land left to Abraham was the land of Canaan. The Lord God sees a bond between Abraham 
and the land. The Lord had promised that all the families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. And that blessing would take place in that particular land. It's not so much that Abraham was anything special or even that that land was anything special aside from the Lord's choosing. Because the Lord had determined that it would be Abraham's great and greatest descendant, our Lord Jesus, who would enact the plan of salvation. And that plan of salvation would be carried out in that land. And so, in anticipation of God's promise being fulfilled, the man Abraham walked the land of promise. The man Abraham walked the land of promise. And so did the man Jesus. Like his great ancestor, our Lord Jesus walked the Holy Land. We're told in the Gospels that he didn't set up a place in the Holy Land to carry out his ministry. Unlike his relative John, who, who set up his place by the Jordan River and the crowds came to him, Jesus went to the crowds. He walked the length and the breadth of the Holy Land. And where Abraham had done that, in anticipation of God's promise being fulfilled that his descendants would inherit that land, Jesus walked that land because he was the king. That was his holy land. It was the land that he had given to Abraham, and now it was the land in which he would walk. His feet, we are told, would carry him from village to village, from town to town, from city to city, where he would teach in their synagogues and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom and heal every disease and every affliction. Jesus walked the land. It was his land. And it was his people. The people that he had come to deliver. So when he looked at these people, what did he see? When he saw the crowds, he saw that they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd are sheep in need of a shepherd. Because sheep left to their own devices wander into unsafe areas and fall easy prey to the predators around them. They need a shepherd. Jesus came to be that shepherd. Because when he saw that these people were harassed and helpless, we're told that he had compassion for them. His heart ached for them because they were his people, the people whom he came to deliver. Even as his heart aches for the harassed and helpless people of our day, because Jesus came to deliver them. Jesus looked upon you in your harassed and helpless state, and he delivered you calling you into his family through the saving waters of baptism, nourishing you with his body and blood of the Lord's Supper, and guiding and, in, and strengthening and encouraging you with the promises found in his holy word. Yes, Jesus walked the length and the breadth of the Holy Land. But his most important walk would begin 
after the judgment hall of Pontius Pilate. And there his feet would carry his ravaged body along the well-worn path leading outside of the city of Jerusalem to a hill called Golgotha. It would be on that hill that Jesus' feet, as well as his hands, would be pierced through with nails as he was crucified. While he was crucified, in order for him to catch a breath, he would have to push up, causing excruciating pain in his feet so that he could get in some air so he could say things like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So he could cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And finally, with one last push, he takes in the air so that he can cry out in a loud voice, It is finished. And then after commending himself into the hands of his father, Jesus gave up his breath, gave up his spirit. The shepherd who had compassion for those harassed and helpless crowds was a shepherd who laid down his life for them and for us. Even though Jesus knew that walking the land would bring him to Calvary, he willingly did so because he knew that the feet that walked the land to Calvary would also be the feet that would carry him out of the empty tomb on his glorious day of resurrection. But despite the suffering that he would endure out of his compassion for the world, the man Jesus walked the land of promise. Amen. The man Abraham walked the land of promise. The man Jesus walked the land of promise. And so did his church. We're told that Jesus commissioned the twelve apostles to go out in pairs to announce the good news of the kingdom and to call people to repentance. They walked the land of promise, as Jesus had, going from town to town and village to village. You and I, as the church of our Lord Jesus, we also walk the holy land. Now that doesn't mean that we've taken a pilgrimage to Israel. What it means is that we as the church bring with us the Lord Jesus Christ. So wherever we set our feet is holy ground. Wherever we go as church into this world we bring the good news of our Lord Jesus. We bring his word. We bring his love. When Jesus sent out his twelve, he said, if you come to a place and people are willing to listen, stay there. If they don't want to listen, leave there. 
In so doing, Jesus warned us that not everyone will welcome the church into their midst. There are those who do. There are those who are eager to hear about the love of Jesus. They are eager to receive his compassion through you and me, through his church. But there are others who want nothing to do with the church or with her Lord. Sometimes we are welcomed in such a way it feels like our dusty feet are receiving a foot washing. Other times we are harshly rejected and we do what Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. But when that rejection happens, does the church stop walking? No. The church moves on. We move on. Because we bring with us the love and compassion of Jesus Christ. The land where we walk is land that belongs to him. Because we all know from John 3.16 that God so loved not just a strip of land a little smaller than the state of New Jersey. God loved the world and gave his only begotten son. Jesus, when he went to the cross, did not give his life just for the inhabitants of a strip of land smaller than the state of New Jersey. He gave his life for all. And he directs his church that wherever we go, we are to, as we've been singing about in our hymn, we are to spread the reign of God the Lord. Jesus had said, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Dear friends, you and I are the answer to that prayer. We are the ones whom Jesus has called to be his church and has sent into his harvest. And so we walk the land. We do so in the name of our Lord Jesus to bring to those we meet his compassion. Compassion for those who are harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And in our day and age, there are plenty of folks like that. They need the shepherd. They need the one who walked the land all the way to the cross and out of the tomb for them. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.